All right, so for those of you just tuning in, I'm about to cast a three versus three Age of Empires 2 game between my viewers as part of my weekly Twitch TV live streams, in which you can follow me on Twitch, Facebook, and Twitter if you want to know when I'm streaming next. The topic of today's video is going to be the Imperial Skirmisher. It's a unique unit added in the Rise of the Rajas expansion. I have a civilization overview for the Vietnamese. If you want to learn more about this civ in greater detail, link to that in the video description below, as well as some tutorials. The Imperial Skirmisher, the long-awaited upgrade to the Elite Skirmisher, has finally arrived to Age of Empires 2 as of 2016. And the team bonus of the Vietnamese is that it gives it to every single teammate that you have. So, in this game, both teams will have access to the Imperial Skirmisher unit. I will be talking a little bit about what makes this unit so interesting, what makes it better than the, than the Elite Skirmisher, and its place in the metagame. Just have to wait for these players to ready up. In the meantime, it looks like I missed a donation from Dale Andrew Darling, who donated $149. Thank you so much, Dale. It's not even my birthday yet, man. Assassin has to go? Don't make me do my intro again! Alright. Lobby Simulator attempt number four. This is the fourth time we've attempted to start this game. Please work. I swear Age of Empires 2 is one of the most iconic RTS games of all time for a reason. Everything besides the gameplay is bad, though. The the netcode's not so great. The tooltips are not so great. <laughs> the lobbies are unbelievably bad, and the rank ladder on AOE2HD is completely broken. But the gameplay. The gameplay is great. That's what we're here for. And it's frozen. And it's not. During this video, I will be talking about the Imperial Skirmisher unit, which I mentioned before. I'm going to take a page out of Ben Brode's book and stitch the lobby and this game together so that on YouTube, you'll never know that it took 35 minutes for this game to start. <laughs> the entire time, interested in watching from Comfy, Comfy from Cologne. What is this madman doing? All right, so... While it's lagging out of control, let me take a brief moment uh, to introduce the players and realize the game's going to go out of sync and we'll have to restart again, but in the meantime... So we have Tantalus playing as the Red Incas, we have the Lockster playing as the Orange Vietnamese, we have Desinsect playing as the Blue Aztecs. On the opposing team, we have Assassin playing as the Green Britons, Miracle Lou playing as the Purple Incas, and Moist, Fat and Moist, playing as the Yellow Vietnamese. The topic of today's video is the Imperial Skirmisher Unit. So during this video, I'll be going over all of the different civilizations in here, the bonuses they have for their Imperial Skirmishers, and just how this iconic unit changes the metagame. Before I do that, I'm going to take a brief moment to question exactly what I'm looking at. So this is not a real build order. Now, Tantalus is newer to Age of Empires 2, so we don't expect perfection. But for those of you who are, uh, who are watching at home right now, let me just tell you that I happen to have a Night Rush tutorial on YouTube, um, and maybe one of my mods will link that in the chat by typing exclamation mark tutorial, yes. uh, which will give you some... I have no idea why it's lagging so badly. Which will give you some very valuable insight on actual build orders and strategies and help introduce you to the game. I have a playlist of those. Um, this is never correct to do for your own... Uh, for the record. Is this, is this even a playable game? Am I wasting my time? You always start the game by building just two houses. If you are new to the game, it's not that terrible to build three. Uh, and it, if that means that you avoid getting housed because you forget to build them, then that's okay. But it's a habit that you should definitely kick uh, at your earliest opportunity. But there is not a build order in this game that involves seven house opening. Notice how Tantalus had the wood to build eight houses at the start, but he consciously chose to build seven. And... <laughs> and the Incas houses support 10 population, right? So that's pretty sick. This dude's got 75 pop. He's never going to get housed. And one of the main problems uh, with new players is that they typically uh, have a lot of inefficiency in their build order. You know, they have a lot of idle time in their town center. They get housed a lot. Uh, their town center is just not creating villagers frequently. Tantalus is never going to have any idle time in his town center uh, because he can just keep creating villagers all day. He never has to build another house. Pretty sick Incas value. <laughs> Okay, so in the Rise of the Rajas expansion, like I said earlier, they added, finally, the long-awaited Imperial Skirmisher upgrade to the Elite Skirmisher, available at the Archer Range if you have the Vietnamese civilization on your team. I was heavily involved in the development uh, of Rise of the Rajas. It was an awesome, awesome time. 
Uh, and it was cool to see how the Vietnamese civilization evolved. Very popular, very popular civilization across the community. I have a detailed civilization overview video on that, which you can also find in the description below. The Vietnamese are essentially a very defensive archer civilization with a relatively slow early game due to the lack of a actually notable economy bonus. But in the late game, they're a very bulky civilization, and the utility that they offer uh, with their Imperial Skirmisher unit is really very, very valuable indeed. Uh, Miracle Lu opening up his wall, by the way, because he wants to go for a boar lure. For those of you who are not familiar with Age of Empires 2, I'll briefly go over the basics here. The general idea is you start with the town center, a couple of villagers, and you have to build up your empire to advance through the ages and conquer your foes. This is one of the most prolific strategy games ever made. It's up there with StarCraft Rude War in terms of how cool and uh, thriving the game actually is as a whole. <laughs> Wow, doesn't uh, Sect actually gets his scout inside Moist Base because of that hole in there. I wonder if that will be significant. In the early game, we generally see players in the Dark Age focusing on building up their economy by producing villagers from their town center and focusing primarily on the food and wood resources. You can see the four resources in the top left. And then combat usually picks up around the Feudal Age, Castle Age, or Imperial Ages. Once a player is 500 food, they are able to advance to the next age. What's interesting about the way the game is set up is that uh, the age system like this gives you ample time to set the economic foundation for the rest of the game. So usually during a match, we take a look at the way the players have assigned their villagers to kind of get a feel and predict what strategy they're going for and then try and counteract it. So the fact that Blue has a scout in here gets to see all this information on whatever Yellow's build order is and then plan the appropriate counter in advance. And the combat will pick up uh, in a couple of minutes. Uh, however, if you scout Tantalus's base, you're probably horribly confused, as you see the, the Seven House opening, and you're like, the Madman, that's crazy. Uh, it's worth noting that the Eagle Scout actually has superior combat stats to the Scout Cavalry unit that most civilizations have, so the Mesoamerican civs have the Eagle Scout instead. Um, it is much better combat stats. So, if it didn't take all those arrow shots from that town center, then it uh, would actually be able to kill the Scout and actually do some... Uh, really annoying early game harassment. If anyone has any questions, feel free to ask me in the Twitch chat. I'll try my best to answer them. Um, no, the players are obligated to make Imperial Skirmishers here, but it's cool to have access to that. The thing with, uh, with balance in the late game is that gold and stone are very valuable finite resources, particularly gold. So gold is used to create most valuable expensive units and research some of the most important technologies in the game. It's a really, really decisive resource to have access to. And there are three units in the game, three military units that you can make, that don't cost any gold. That is the Scout Cavalry and its associated upgrades, the Light Cavalry and Hussar. We have the Spearmen, Pikemen, and Halberdier, all upgraded from the Spearmen. And then we have the Skirmisher, Elite Skirmisher, and now the Imperial Skirmisher. So that's the ranged unit. This is the, the Scout is the Cavalry one, and then the Spearmen is the Infantry one. They're all different classes of units with different strengths and weaknesses. The Imperial Skirmisher being added to the game is pretty huge because... A common, I guess, misconception is that Halberdiers are too strong uh, compared to the Elite Skirmisher, or the Elite Skirmisher is just too weak. Uh, but really, the game is actually remarkably well balanced at a competitive level, and it's not, uh, it's actually not like that. It's because Elite Skirmishers actually have an attack bonus versus um, Halberdiers, so it balances out. And you have to keep in mind that Elite Skirmishers, even though Halberdiers have that extra upgrade, these skirmishers are still really useful as a counter unit, and sometimes you want range support in your in your army too. Uh, there will be situations when you need to make it. It's just an archer counter unit. And the Imperial Skirmisher is just the type of thing that pushes it over the edge. You make those units uh, either as counters to a specific army, or as just a way to conserve gold in the late game. So just having extra stats like the Imperial Skirmisher has is colossal. Let's take a brief moment to compare the stats between the two. So, the Elite Skirmisher and the Imperial Skirmisher both have 35 HP. The Imperial Skirmisher, what does it gain? It gains one attack. So the Elite Skirmisher is three attack, four pierce armor, zero melee armor. The Imperial Skirmisher is four attack and five pierce armor. The Imperial Skirmisher also gains additional attack bonuses. It gains plus one extra versus archers, so it's four to five. And then another extra versus cavalry archers, that goes from two to three. They both have the same bonus of three versus spearmen, but the one extra base attack makes them significantly better versus halberdiers. Remember that bonus damage in Age of Empires 2, attack bonuses are applied after resistances. So there's a minimum of one damage, and then the attack bonuses is wide, uh, which is very significant when dealing with units with, uh, with high armor. Uh, it's worth noting that the Imperial Skirmisher and just units in general, let's say versus a cavalry archer, a cavalry archer is... 
it, it has so many weaknesses. It has all the weaknesses of a cavalry unit and an archer unit, as well as the strengths of both of them, which means that an Imperial Skirmisher has plus five attack versus archers, plus three versus cavalry archers, so they're dealing plus eight versus cavalry archers, which is one of the many reasons why cavalry archers aren't that typically a meta-defining force as a unit, uh, outside of civilizations with really strong bonuses to them, like the Huns. In addition to the unit being really expensive and cumbersome to get out because you need all these upgrades, it's just so easy to counter with Elite Skirmishers. And since, Imper uh, since Elite Skirmishers got a cost reduction in one of the more recent balance patches, and now the Imperial Skirmisher is in the game, it just further disincentivizes your opponents from actually making cavalry archers. Maybe you'll learn something new today, and if you want, I... I'd be happy to do an overview on the Genitour. I know the Genitour is... It's the Berbers team bonus that they give to their team. Uh, it's a, its like a mounted elite skirmisher. I think it's generally a better unit than the Imperial Skirmisher, just as more stats. But it's significantly more expensive. What makes it better, and has less range, uh, what makes it better to me, and as no attackers as Spearman, but... What makes it better to me, though, is the mobility of it. Uh, Hussars see a lot of play because they can just avoid armies entirely, and if you're ever making cavalry archers, because I don't think they're as bad as people say they are, but they're still generally worse than crossbows, uh, it's the mobility that makes them useful. And the fact that genitures can actually be used as a viable raiding force is extremely, extremely powerful. Uh, in addition to them just having better stats. I'd say in the late game, when you have a gigantic economy, and you're able to just constantly field out units, then... The cost of an elite skirmisher is not that much. Like, you're spending, what, 35 wood and 25 food, and then I think the genitour uh, off the top of my head is 50 wood and 35 food? Well, I might have that backwards. Is it 50 food? Oh, it's 50 food and 35 wood. Okay. So, I think that's not a big deal. I think that, in general, you will have the economy in the late game to be able to create genitours and that you would actually rather have them over uh, imperial skirmishers in a lot of cases but the imperial skirmisher being its own type of unit class uh compared to the genitour does carry its pros and cons and of course the vietnamese and berbers are different civilizations and sometimes having the extra range in the attack versus spearmen is better sure the genitour can kite the spearmen back but the imperial skirm does plus three bonus damage while our players are advancing through the ages, I will also use this as a brief opportunity to explain why some of the civs are in the game here. We're not, we're missing one of them. I really wanted to see some, uh, some Byzantines, right? There's no Byzantines in this game. That's a shame. So, this is our Vietnamese player. Now, the Vietnamese have 10% uh, bonus HP on their archery range units. It goes to 10%, 15% in the Castle Age, 20% in the Imperial Age. Uh, it was actually one of the things they suggested early in development. It was really cool to see that. Uh, actually come into play because I think that that one it makes their Imperial Skirm it's a cool design thing because it makes their Imperial Skirmishers better than the average one it gives them some identity as a Civ and, and it encourages them to make a wider variety of units than just archers like it even lets you humor the thought of making cav archers uh, they're not that bad uh, so they have, uh, compared to 35 HP in the Imperial Age, their Imperial Skirmisher has 43. And this extra HP bonus is really nice, because what it does... Oh, he's coming in there with the, the Monk Rush. Um, what it does is it generally allows your Skirmishers and your Archers to live one additional hit, which is pretty, pretty big. Uh, I don't think Red is rushing, no, but uh, Blue is going to rush. Oh, well, okay, maybe Red is rushing, what the hell? <laughs> Blue is going to rush Yellow, yes. Uh, and I will, of course talk a little bit about that and we'll get back to what makes these skirms sick but the Aztecs got they've got that Lottle and the Imperial Age gives their skirms plus one range and plus one attack it's huge but they're missing I think it's ring archer armor and they're also missing thumb ring so it is a trade-off but the extra range and attack is it's huge believe me uh also he's also Aztecs uh there's an Incas player in here somewhere it's, it's you it's this guy uh, the Incas have no minimum range on their skirmishers which is actually really sick because the elite skirmisher and the uh the Jetta Tour, they can't attack units that are at the base of them. They have a minimum range of one. Why does this happen in every game of Age of Empires I've ever played, where the moment you open your walls to build a building, that's when your opponent shows up. That's just, there has to be some kind of law of Age of Empires <laughs> that makes that happen every time. So, Tantalus, being a baller that he is, is attempting to rush with archers in a map where people start with palisade walls, but that's like not that insane, because he will be able to get through these anyway. Uh, and the Britons have yeoman. Uh, which gives their Imperial Skirmishers, Elite Skirmishers, plus one range. So, here comes the Monk Rush. Monk Rush, a very powerful strategy from the Aztecs for a million different reasons. The extra HP that they get, they get five HP in their 
Monk per technology, Monk technology resource, that's huge. The extra relic income is great. Like he should grab that like immediately. He'll be generating so much money. It's a team bonus too, it's colossal. Uh, the Aztecs have Eagle Warriors, which uh, resist conversion. It's a fast moving infantry unit, excellent counter to any monks. And on a map like this, the, the monk and siege push is very powerful. It's a slow strategy, so you don't see it on open aggressive maps where it's difficult to wall, but you do see it on maps like this in Arena, where we call them closed maps because it's very easy to actually defend yourself in the early game. And a, a strategy like this, which is literally and figuratively slow, <laughs> is quite devastating. Slowly move the line forward. Monks convert enemy units to your side, and they can also convert buildings too to Christianity, just like in real life. <laughs> wow! It looks like Tantalus on the bottom side of the map will be moving in, taking down these Palisade Walls, but Miracle Lou, not born yesterday, not with those wrinkles. The way his his map gen is so unbelievably OP, what is this? Uh, the maps in AOE 2 are, are randomized, and the distance of the resources are relatively the same, but the orientation of them is different, and this is unbelievable. Look how, look how sexy this map is. Like he could have even saved more wood by building his buildings like this. And one of the things that makes Age of Empires 2 such a fascinating, interesting game with so much longevity to it, besides things like the random maps and just how balanced and interesting the gameplay is, uh, is how much freedom you have in what you do. This is a game that really tests your mechanics at the core level, and that you can use your buildings as makeshift walls. You can build your buildings anywhere. You can even wall off the opposing resources. You can build towers in their base, build castles in their base. If you go to my channel and you watch my Break the Meta Persian Douche video, there's a strategy in this game where you delete your town center and build a new one next to your opponents, put your villagers in it, and start firing arrows out because <laughs> garrisoned units fire arrows outside of buildings. And no other game is that actually possible. There is a map in this game where there's nothing but trees. It's called Forest Nothing. Your town center is just surrounded by trees. There's no other terrain. And it's a playable map. I use the word playable loosely. And if you want to see a good example of that, you go to T90 Official's channel and you can look at his Forest Nothing video. <laughs> I use the word, I am definitely misusing the word playable. It's literally playable, but it's figuratively not. Thank you so much, Epic Laser, for the 18-month uh, resub. Really appreciate it. Thank you for the support. Blackman says, many pagan temples were converted to become churches like the Pantheon at Rome, and the Hagia Sophia was converted from Christian uh, Christianity to Islam when it became a monk. So yes, just in real life. <laughs> That's why we come to the stream for the history facts. Thank you. Fascinating. Tantalus! Despite his unorthodox early game build, hasn't had to build a house since 1999, and actually is doing a really good job with his rush. Like, <laughs> he built a second TC, like, I, I love this guy. But unfortunately for him, Assassin is also older than time itself, and he is coming in with two knights. These are two very metagame defining units. Let's switch back to Tantalus' perspective and watch this battle real fast. So I think Tantalus loses this fight, but he is doing it right in that when you're engaging knights, ah, he's just taking so much free damage, so god. You have to focus fire them down individually at a time because you're reducing the total amount of DPS that your opponent's army actually has if you pick off the units. I don't actually know if anyone from Katie Rue's stream is still watching. <laughs> That's why I'm spending extra time explaining some of the basics of the game in case some of you have never heard of Age of Empires 2, but I got a lot of hosts today uh, from Jordan and Katie, which I appreciate. So yes. Let me know if you have no idea what AOE 2 is, and I can, uh, I can clear clear up any questions that you might have. Oh, okay, alright, Bobster's still here, good enough. So, Knights and Crossmen, two very defining metagame units, they're just very powerful in general, so... Uh, particularly, like, Knights vs. Crossmen kind of defines the Castle Age, and what how that dynamic usually works out is, once you reach a critical mass of Crossmen, you get enough of them, since the Knights melee and normally beats these ranged units due to its nice, thick, shiny armor, and it's very high HP stat, normally beats those ranged units, but if you get enough of them, you get a death ball, it's that threshold where you can just kill the knights before they get up to you. And then the dynamic completely shifts on its head. And then, that's when the Mangonel unit comes into play in Age of Empires 2. This unit is an area of effect siege weapon that is possessed by Satan and can move on its own. This thing decides games, and it's basically the subject of every Age of Empires 2 highlight reel. Because <laughs> this thing deals 40 damage in AoE, but it is so clunky and difficult to use. But a good player can take uh, can take advantage of the Mangonel, and that's kind of one of the comeback mechanics in this game, is trading one Mangonel for like 40 Archer units. If you're really good, you can do that. Uh, 
Here comes the uh, elite skirmishers from Tantalus, applying a lot of pressure, but... But, 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 that single knight will demolish this army. Yes. Skirmishers can't attack units that are at the base of them. They have one minimum range, which means that they are so much worse versus knights than crossmen or really anything else. This unit just gets decimated. It deals... Well, I can't select it because it's uh, prioritizing the building, but, um... Someone send this to Cheese on Toast later and, and clip this. I thought they fixed that, but that should never... Even if I'm watching from Tantalus' perspective, <laughs> I shouldn't do that. Oh my. Uh, good, new good news, everyone. The knight is dead. So now pikemen are coming out. The pikemen being the counter unit to the knight. Uh, Tantalus is saving a lot of gold with his army, but he's make they're called trash. The units that don't cost gold are called trash units for a reason, because they're trash. But they cost no gold. So his army offers basically no offensive presence. And it's just These are just utility counter units. If you played any RTS games, you're aware of that. Um, I think he should add some more substance to his army. It's like he's got all the spice, but no steak. And it looks like... Rattan Archer's coming out from Moist. Rattan Archers have four Pierce Armor, so they're an excellent counter versus his range... Uh, versus most ranged units. Uh, they have zero melee armor, though, so they're quite weak to things like Eagle Warriors. Extremely weak to Eagle Warriors. This is bold of, of Moist to do this. Very bold, considering that Eagle Scouts are an option. But notably, the Rattan Archer is six attack compared to a Crossman's five, so they're much better versus things that are normally... You see the Crossman here. Much, much, much better versus things with high pierce armor. If you get enough upgrades on your uh, Rattan Archer, you can actually deal two damage to a Mangonel, which is a, a huge turning point. I would say this is excellent castle placement because it's on a hill and it applies a lot of offensive pressure, but holy shit! Because of the hill advantage, if you have higher, if you have the high ground, <laughs> you take reduced damage and deal more, this villager lives despite having 40 HP. Well played, Obi-Wan. Antanalus lives to, lives to tell the tale. Ooh, it was a huge mangonel shot, just like I was talking about before. Tantalus will get that castle coming up. Coming up, but Assassin doing his best to carry this game. Can he do it? I don't know. Uh, monks, not so good versus Rattan Archers. Rattan Archers have a nice, solid six attacks. So they kill them pretty darn quickly. Rattan Archers do one less range than Crossmen. does matter when you're dealing with, like, monks, but it's still... Like, monks are... Monks are used primarily as a way to deal with expensive melee units like knights. Even though knights are reasonable speed, they're really good versus expensive melees. They're slow like elephants. Uh, but monks are countered by mass ranged units. They can just kill them before they get their conversion off. That's why the mangonel comes in. Hopefully it makes sense. Fat Ambassador asks, if you're a vegan, is spice but no steak a good thing? Yes. He's going for the vegan build. <laughs> Stinky Cheese says, you underestimate my power. Sorry, which is Dan Rez, you're one more Futurama reference away from me donating, and my poor college student that can't afford that. Your well-being comes first, so but I really appreciate it, uh, Starmy Bish. <laughs> really appreciate it, man. Thank you. I mean, one of the ways to support me if you're a poor college student um, is by just not using ad blocker and not skipping the ads, uh, and just being an awesome, wonderful person, tuning into my stream, sharing it around, answering comments on my behalf. Sharing my content, mentioning me in public forums, all that stuff really helps. So thank you, man. Uh, but uh, if you if you have to eat your instant ramen, it's okay. I will I will live. <laughs> I'm just happy to have you. So, Desnect, where's the Eagle Warriors? Tell me where they are. Where are the Eagle Warriors, Harvey? You have so much gold, friend. But he is in the Imperial Age. He's the first player to imp, uh, and. Technology advantages everything in Age of Empires 2. You have access to infinitely more powerful units. You underestimate Stinky Cheese's power. Dude, I don't think you got the eco for this. You have the eco for eagles. Eagles cost 50 gold and 20 food. It's perfect. Eagles kill both of these units. But skirmishers? I mean, skirmishers kill both these units too, but you gotta get the Magnal Shot of the Gods. We'll see. We'll see. How many layers of reality is Desnect on? Can Blue get the shot? No, he cannot. Here comes Assassin with the two light cavalry. Two versus one, baby rage. Blue losing his mangonel, and those things cost a million dollars. It's like buying a car. So losing one to the light cavalry, which costs nothing but food, because you, you only have to feed them. You don't have to pay these guys, uh, compared to most normal soldiers. That's why they also just don't work very hard and only deal seven damage. Uh, and you'd think they'd be more... you think they'd be easier to convert, because you don't pay them, but I don't know. Assassin defending with the Longbowmen, uh, red with a very nice, well-balanced army, I would say. Uh, nice little Inca's mirror match here. It'd be very difficult to break this line. 
Uh, he needs an answer to this Manganel, but that's why he's got his own uh, Siege Workshop, so great play there. Uh, Tantalus is producing villagers constantly. That's very important. And holy shit, Orange has a fat army. He hasn't really been able to do anything with it yet. And Blue's kind of getting 2v1 now, so I wonder if Orange is going to turn around or if he's going to push on the wrong side. See, when you're playing AoE2, you have to make the tough decision, which is... And it's a 3v3. Which flank do I help? Well, you want to help the flank that's usually losing. Otherwise, you're making a huge gamble. And what, what, uh, what Orange is doing is he's saying, Okay, I think that Blue will die slowly enough that I can just crush the resistance. The rebel scum. That's a big risk. I don't know about that. JT Lumina says, I told everyone I talked to about you. Turns out he already knew you. Well, I appreciate it, JT Lumina. Thank you for sharing me around. That ambassador said vegans would probably suck at AoE. Because <laughs> their, their army has no stake. I'm sure vegans are, are excellent at AoE. Um, oh, but, the, but then again, then again, they can't eat the sheep, right? Ah, if only they could put the cows in the animal nursery and generate infinite food. Vegans are great at Star Wars Galactic Battlegrounds. That I'm sure of. So Tantalus is flexing a little bit too hard and has maybe busted open a blood vessel or something. That's not good. Um, be careful who you flex on. Sometimes, sometimes they've just got a gun. And Tantalus, unfortunately, like, there's no way there's no way this castle would ever work. <laughs> it's easy for me to say this in retrospect, uh, and I'm saying this for your own reference, so that when you play your own games later, um, it's much easier for me as the caster uh, to be able to analyze the entire entire situation. When you have an opponent in the Imperial Age who's also on your side, you cannot build a forward castle like that. Also, I think he's severely overestimating his strength. Uh, he thinks he, he has the high ground over here, but but Obi-Wan dies later. <laughs> so it doesn't actually work out, spoiler alert. Uh, for those of you who haven't seen Star Wars Episode Four, <laughs> He should be building this castle defensively. He's losing. And if you're, if you're not sure if you're winning or losing, because it does take a lot of experience in AV2 to be able to read... Um, to be able to read a situation, that's what the scoreboard is for. And the scoreboard is a remarkably accurate way to gauge, at a glance, how powerful you are in any given situation. It's not completely accurate, but if your score is, we'll say, 3,000 lower than the guy on your side, then... Oh, that's, that's bad news bears. That is the definition of bad news bears, if you look that up. You'll just see this clip. You can't drop a forward castle. You can only flex on people who are weaker than you. Uh, but the more experience that you get, the more you'll know. Wow, that looks like there was a big Magnal shot I may have missed. So Orange is coming over here. He is now defending the correct side, but then again, I think Orange is just... He's coming down with an acute case of Indecision 2017. I've been in his shoes where I have sent my entire army on the bottom side of the map. I'm like, okay, I'm going to go help you insert teammate here. And then, the moment that your reinforcements arrive over here, your army is now needed where it was before. And that's just horribly embarrassing, and that sucks. <laughs> so my heart goes out to him. Poor Tantalus. Hey, he's struggling a little bit because he he's just not building enough villagers. Like, two town centers is never enough. You need at least at least three, if not four, and you need to get to 100 ASAP. Let's place our bets. For those of you who are watching, uh, I want you to imagine your mind a number. We're going to see what his population is. Did you pick a number? 79. So he actually has built one house since we last checked in. Uh, no, he hasn't, he hasn't built a house since I checked in on him. It's... 39 minutes in the game, and he's building his next houses. The extra five population from that 75 is that second town center. You madman, I love you. Yeah, yeah, buddy. Holy shit. For those of you who guessed 75, you're really smart because you remember that number from earlier in the game. Wow, that extra five was from the town center. Marry me. Marry me right now. Um, yeah, he just needs to build more villagers. Uh, he's going up to info, which is good, and he is building more villagers, so that... That solidifies it. We are now engaged. Uh, and speaking of engagements, yellow moving in on the top side. Trying to uh, moisten up those Imperial Skirmishers, but they're too tanky. He's missing chemistry, right? Like, this gets to 4 plus 5 attack. That's really good. 4 plus 5 attack and 9 range. Oh, the Aztecs are also missing Thumb Ring. I think I might be wrong on this, because I'm doing this off the top of my head. And while I might be extremely nerdy and obsessed with this game, I don't know all the units' stats off the top of my head. I'm going to say the Skirmisher is like 90% accuracy, I think. So, a lack of thumb ring, yeah, you fire slower and you don't have 100% accuracy versus stationary targets. It kind of sucks, but it's not its not the end of the world. I, I really feel like Atlatl is actually good tech, and the fact that the Aztecs create military units 15% faster is huge. 
So I think their Imperial Skirmishers are valuable. Uh, you're gonna need to send some help on the other side, my friend, though, because I think that this guy's going to die. Love to see the Imperial Skirmishers actually being used. I think that a tech I really underrate, and that almost every player underrates, is uh, Andy and Sling. Somewhere, somewhere in a room filled with cigar smoke, Cision is laughing. Fools! He always knew that Andean Sling was good. Andean Sling removes the minimum range from your skirmisher units, and I think Slingers too. Um, it's sick. It's actually sick. You'd be surprised, but if you actually play enough games, uh, you will realize that the minimum range on skirmishers makes them a lot worse versus Halberdiers and versus Hussars. But all of a sudden, you have Andean Sling? Ah! Oh. Ah, you're not afraid anymore of those cavalry units and those Halberdiers, no. Uh, to put in perspective, the one minimum range that was added to the organ gun was such a colossal nerf that the unit just feels like just hot, hot garbage now. Uh, and I hope that they buff it back and give it some kind of identity. Uh, it's, it's a pretty big nerf. I do think that was a necessary nerf, though, to be to be fair and completely clear. I think it was a 100% necessary nerf. I just think that they should give it something back in return. What must we give it in return? Asked the organ gun. Everything, replied Sujin. The unit is still okay, though. Still okay. I like Blue's army. This is actually a very close game. He's got all the Onagers in here, versus the mass ranged army is excellent. But if this, uh... This castle goes up, that's gonna stop this push. Well, it's gonna slow it down. Uh, Trebuchet will eventually take this castle down from a very safe, comfortable distance. And, uh, yeah, he's just not focused down, focusing down the villagers. That's from Blue. That's from Blue. Let's go to Blue's perspective. It's 170 population. Ah, it looks like he has also come down with an acute case of small economy. Look these 2k food. Gotta build more villagers, my friend. Minimum of 100. Every game. Yes, he is JT Lemon Knight. Thank you, Jesus. Please love Portuguese. If only I had the power. I think that the Portuguese are strong in some situations. They're just really bad in, like, 1v1s and open maps. And they're just a hard sift to balance, just based off the way they're designed. Uh, I do want to see the organ gun, though, getting a little bit of love. I think that unit is just... Like, the fact that the splash damage deals only one feels kind of lame. Uh, but it's a cool unit, and I think the Portuguese are still useful in some situations. It's just they feel a little, a little neutered in some respects. Um, Tantalus is, is coming down with a mighty case of dead. Captain Ram's moving in. I, uh, I think he needs help badly. And Orange is building some military buildings over here. He's got a barracks. He's got a bunch of archery ranges. I think he's making stuff. Hey, he's a 200 pop. Oh no, he's a 200 pop! I hate when this happens too. You need to get your army on the other side of the map, and you're actually at max population. Does he have too many villagers? Is he too good at this game? Yes. Oh, he might be too good at this game. He might have too many villagers. It's weird. Blockster. Perhaps actually over Boom slightly. Maybe he needs to delete a couple of villagers. Or he needs to contribute some money to his dying teammates. When you're this rich, I'm like slowly dying from my allergies while doing this. I think that these are for evil warriors, which I, I love because they just destroy this army. Absolutely eat it. Om nom. Just, just kill everything. The eagle, the elite eagle warriors, or as uh, Zach would sometimes call them, elite eagle warriors. <laughs> uh, just, they just destroy this entire army. They take one damage from these skirmishers. They mop up all the siege weapons. They have attack bonus versus. The, it's just disgusting. Absolutely disgusting. However, this, this poor fellow has no eco. He did replace his town center, so... When you're teaching someone the game, always tell them the things they're doing right, too, in addition to the things they're doing wrong. It's really important to do that. Otherwise, it's just demoralizing and you're an asshole. Um, so always try to take the time to point out the things the players both do right and wrong. Um, it's important to know that they're making progress. And uh, Tantalus made some great plays, but he's just getting 2v1 right now. Uh, and he really needs help from Orange, who does not have enough population to send any reinforcements. So he needs to delete some villagers. I... One time I won a game by deleting some of my military units in, like, a 1700 rated uh, Wubly Black Forest game back in the day. Uh, by deleting some of my military units in the top flank, just so I could spawn them on the bottom. <laughs> that's normally bad. <laughs> normally that's bad, but sometimes that will win you the game. Tantalus is making all, the, making all the right choices here to keep himself alive. Like, this defensive castle is important, but he's boxed in. Like, this is the definition of boxed in. He needs assistance right now. They're pushing on the top side, but they're not going to be able to kill Moist, Moist yet. Like, you're just not going to be able to kill him fast enough. I don't know. When you have this much money and you're at max population, just tribute, just tribute stuff. Even asking them like what they need is, is nice, but at this point, just assume Tantalus needs CPR and just everything. And he needs, he needs dudes. He needs orange dudes. Believe me. 
He needs tremendous orange dudes in his base right now. And Lockster, though, still on the top side of the map. Uh, like cavalry choice is, is good versus this army, but the Britons... Britons like cavalry are really weak uh, due to missing uh, bloodlines and... Yeah, just missing bloodlines, but they do have all the blacksmith upgrades. Uh... <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. I, I, I'm not a, I understand why he's doing this. Maybe he's doing this to save cash. It's good enough. I mean, he can use to snipe to siege weapons. I think that's ultimately what it is, is to snipe to siege weapons, and I think it's good enough. There aren't enough halberdiers up here to really uh, disincentivize that, but uh, I do think that there are enough range units. Look at 48 HP. Nice. So, what can Tantalus do in this situation? Well, he... I mean, he could run his villagers away. The dude is dead. He's actually just... It's just completely dead. Mmm, it's the inflexibility of Team Orange, Blue, and Red that will cost them dearly. Um, I, so, at this point, it's too late, but they had a couple options, uh, all of which were shitty, but you had to take one of them at some point. You have to press the button. They could have, he could have taken his army and walked all the way around. Could have done that. That would have sucked because Igor is really good here. Great choice. Um, what would have sucked is it would take way too long. These are not fast units. Or he could have deleted some of them, or deleted some villagers, to start spawning military units. He didn't do either of them. <laughs> and Red has nowhere to run. Yes. Or does he? Check back on that in a moment. Yeah, um, another thing is that Red's not really communicating. Uh, I think that a lot of players uh, tend to, to tunnel vision, and that's totally fine. Like, when you're learning Age of Empires 2... You know, you, people generally stick to their screen, and if there's no flaring or communication of any description going on, then they might not notice. So, probably, the, their team didn't notice. Now, this doesn't mean you should be that guy, and we all know that guy I'm talking about, that is, like, flaring you non-stop and just gives up at the drop of a hat. You don't want to be him. You do want to, very politely, though, communicate with your team and be like, Hello, team. It is I, Humble Carpet Merchant, and I am dying. Uh, some assistance would be much appreciated. Thank you in advance. Uh, and then you put a smiley face or something. But, you know, always say please, always be polite, but uh, definitely communicate. <laughs> if you want your teammates to do things, the last thing you want to do is to be like, why don't you send army fucking noob kill yourself? Because then they'll be like, well, actually, it sure would be a shame if you, if you died. It sure would be a shame if no one sent help. But yeah, Red, I think, actually got defeated. <laughs> I think that's happened in one of my videos in years, where a player got defeated outside of Regicide. Poor Red. Got between a rock and a hard place. Poor guy, man. I mean, these two are doing a great job pushing on the top. Well played, blue and orange. Uh, but they needed to send some assistance to him. There's no way he could have taken on these two, these two titans. No way. No way at all. And alas, they are going to call GG, which I think is fair. Great game in a nutshell. Hope you all enjoyed my commentary and whatnot. If you did, please do share it around. Leave a thumbs up and a comment. Really appreciate it. I read all your comments, even if I don't get a chance to respond to each of them individually. And whenever I read comments, even outside of my own, just on various forums, Reddit and whatnot, mentioning me, it always makes my day. So thank you so much. Uh, I also appreciate those who take the time to check out the content I do for games beyond just a hey, we do. Maintain my sanity. You grow the channel. You grow the Age of Empires community. You're the real hero. But alas, it's going to take a lot for Tantalus to believe in the existence of heroes. My heart goes out to him. He lost 69 buildings. <sighs> Give him a moment of silence. Poor guy. I think he made a lot of good plays, and we have to recognize that. The Elite Eagle Warriors was the, per the perfect unit to respond to that situation. The perfect unit. Uh, and he recognized that, and he did apply some great pressure. But what he lacked was some help, and also just the economy. His economy is very tiny. 79 villagers. He was building it up, but uh, that's not going to cut it. You have to have a minimum of 100. Uh, but yeah, he played well. Uh, everyone, in this, everyone in this game played well. Uh, unfortunately, Orange, if he was an octopus, they, they could have won this game. If he could be in 18 locations at once, but alas, he only has two arms. Not enough radiation for him. Uh, it was not able to uh, defend Red. I think he had an opportunity to, though. <laughs> if he had more population, maybe. Uh, may have slightly overboomed, may have wanted to delete his army, some of it, or send some of it. I don't know, difficult to say. Um, I think that Assassin and Moist did an excellent job stalling. Uh, when one of your flanks is winning, all you need to do is stall the other one. 
uh, to inevitably win the game. And they did just that. Assassin played out of his mind. This was a, a great game to watch. Hope you all enjoyed it as much as I did. Fat and moist. You did well, my friend. <laughs> it's okay, Beloxter. I, I saw you were uh, you're in the should I stay or should I go situation where you know you, you wanted to go one way and then you needed to go the other way. Uh, it's, it's tough. It's tough. I started streaming almost three hours ago, Mick Lagarde. Or uh, Mick, yeah, Mick Lagarde. I did, I did the crack. Thank you for playing, Fat and Moist, and thank you all for watching and showing your support. I am uh, exhausted now. It is peak allergy season, so uh, I'm going to go clip this, do do some editing because I have to, because this, this game took four attempts to get started, but it was worth it, and I'm glad. Uh, and hopefully I gained a lot of new followers and subscribers today. I heavily encourage it and appreciate it if you guys would check out my social media, uh, guys and gals. And follow me on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, etc. Which I will link now, because uh, I think that my... I think that my bot only links my Facebook because I need to fix that, and I suck working on that. Then there's also the ResQuit subreddit. Alas, Basumorsu, I'm a man of finite stamina, and I've been streaming for quite some time. Thanks so much for watching. I'll see you all later. Hey, great to have you, ADHD is me. I hope you, uh, hope you enjoyed it and learned some stuff today. Uh, and I hope I exposed a bunch of new people to AOE too. Have a wonderful day, everybody. I'm going to run a quick ad, so if you want to support the channel, you can stick around for that. And I'm going to see if Mem is streaming or something. Is Mem streaming? Then maybe I'll host him. Where's that Mem guy? Tell me where he is. Where's Mem Harvey? He's not streaming. Nobody's streaming. Feels lonely, man. All right, well, uh, I'm going to run a quick ad. Your support means a lot to me. You guys are awesome. Thank you. Thanks, Mighty Bilbo, sir. See you, Corvick. See you, Regular Panda. Oh, Regular Panda! Good to see you again. See Sam, Washi, Pete, Dadubadap, Kanye West. Miracle Lou. See McKay. Thank you, Sam, for the three months resub. Appreciate it. See you, Twist. See you, Dale. Thank you, Dale, for all your donations. See the Lockster. See you, Star. See you, Motham, Melanie. And every person that I am inevitably going to miss somebody. See Ross. Ross Tars. Thank you, G-Man Wallace, for subscribing. Thank you. See you, Basu Moru, and the Mycologist, as well as Sian Vidi. Some of you might not be able to hear this because of the ad, but if you watch it on YouTube later, you're dedicated. See you, Reaper, Henry the Fortunate. Thanks for the sub, G-Man Walls. Appreciate it. Toodles, everybody. Uh, and by the way, if you're a subscriber to me on Twitch, uh, you can whisper Melanie or one of my mods and get a link to my Discord. Uh, I'd love to have you there. Have a wonderful day. Toodles. See you, Twisted Spoon. Great game to watch. And my live streaming schedule is below on Twitch. Keep an eye on that. But if you follow me on Facebook and Twitter, you'll know when I'm streaming next. And if you follow me on Twitch, you'll also get an email. And on YouTube, I upload a video. So, you, yeah. Keep your eyes peeled. I'm going to do a special stream for my birthday.